Spirit come. Come, rest among us. Bring your presence. Bring your peace. Bring your comfort. Bring your fire. Bring your power. May we hear what you have to say to us today, Lord. May your Holy Spirit rest upon us and come to us in a way that brings life. May the words that you have given me to share today and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Today's uh, scripture, oh, you look at that. See, no way Jesus and the guy's just kind of like, uh, you know, floating there. No way. You know? <laughs> uh, I'll get into that. You'll hear and understand a little bit what I'm saying. Bit. But let's go to the scripture. And... Um, preaching from the first chapter of Acts, and here beginning with the uh, the first verse. And you know you don't need glasses, folks. It's a little blurry, <laughs> so that's just the way it, it jumps in and out of blurriness. So I have to figure out exactly what's happening there. But Luke, Luke wrote the book of Acts along with the Gospel of Luke. And so he says in the first book, and he's talking about the Gospel of Luke, and in the first book, Theophilus, and he's, so he's writing to this person called Theophilus. Did you know that Theophilus translates friend of God? We were singing that song. That was the opening song. I am a friend of God. So maybe... Because we are the friend of God, we can take it that Luke was writing this book for us. In the first book, Theophilus, Friend of God, I wrote all about, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. It's interesting. Jesus' whole ministry was about the kingdom of God, helping us understand what that kingdom is. And even in his resurrected state, he continues to want to make sure we understand what God's kingdom really is and what it's about. And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They're, they're waiting. People, we're all wanting, we're desiring for that, that, that God's kingdom you know, to become a reality. Jesus replied, It is not for you to nor the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, we don't necessarily know when God is going to fully establish God's kingdom in its final state but we will still receive the power. We can have that power of the kingdom 
Now you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for us. No, is there a 12? I think we ended at 11. Isn't that through 14? 14. Did I? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's keep reading. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city there, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. No way. No way. Have you ever said that when you've seen something that has been so totally astounding? Maybe you've seen it with your eyes, but you can't really fully comprehend it or grasp it yet. And you, you, you say, no way, you can't do that. You know, it's usually, uh, when you say it, you're, you're saying it in, in amazement. You're saying it with a, with a, a sense of being startled and, and and you know sometimes when we say no way it's because we we've seen something in the in the physical world that just seems too unbelievable to to have really happened you know youtube's great for this because youtube got so many amazing things that that people can do and you, you just say no way did he really do that i was just watching the other day about you, you know they've got these I don't know what you even call them, winged suits, flying suits. And people stand on the top of cliffs thousands of feet down, and they jump <laughs> off the edge of these cliffs with these winged suits. And they're flying around. They're, they look like rocking a flying squirrel, you know? They're just going round and round. And, and, and it's unbelievable the tricks that they do. And I'm thinking, no way. How do they do that? I, I, and I usually don't say, no way I'm going to do that. <laughs> but, but, you know, or there's other times we might say, no way. And, you, and it's with such a sense of joy, such a sense of excitement, or, or, or like something great was accomplished, like a, 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 maybe a, a, a child from a disadvantaged family who really stuck to studying and studied hard. And, and then when uh, they, it, it got to the end of their high school years, they got a full scholarship to college. And you say, no way. Thank God. Praise the Lord. I had a no way experience happen to me yesterday. I was talking to Thela. And, and, and Thela had hinted at this a few days earlier when I had seen her. And she was saying, you know, well, you know, I know I've been in hospice care, but they've just released me from hospice care. They're saying I'm doing too well. I'm doing too well to be in hospice care. And I go, no way! No way! Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Amazing. Now, let's take ourselves back and imagine that you're there 
with Jesus, but you've never, you've never heard of Jesus. You imagine you had never ever heard of Jesus. And in the synagogue where you attend, there's a, 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 a man with an unclean spirit. And this spirit torments him and causes him harm. And he shouts out and he does all kinds of things that disrupt the, the, the service from time to time. And, 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 and Jesus walks into the synagogue and says to the unclean spirit, be silent and come out of him. Demon convulses the man, throws him to the ground, but then it comes out of him, leaving him unharmed and in his right mind. Scripture says all those that were watching were amazed and kept saying to one another, What kind of utterance is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. If I'd been there, I'd probably have been saying, no way. No way. How does he do that? He can't do that. Continue to imagine that you have never, ever heard of Jesus. And, and, and you're present there when, when several people bring in a, a, a man who has been paralyzed, bring him in on his bed and, and lay him before Jesus. And, and Jesus says to the man, stand up and take your bed and go home. And immediately the man stands up. He picks up what he's been lying on and he goes home giving glory to God. Scripture says, amazement seized all who were watching, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. He'd probably say, no way. No way. Now continue to imagine that you have never heard of who this Jesus is. And you're in Jairus' house. You're there with all the mourners on weeping and wailing over the death of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. And when Jesus comes in, he says, Don't weep, for she's not dead. She's only sleeping. Well, you and I would probably have been a part of the crowd that Scripture says laughed at Jesus, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Scripture continues to say that her parents were astonished we'd probably be saying, no way, no way. And we'd be astonished too. Now, imagine that you heard of this Jesus Grok guy, and he was coming out to the side of the mountain, and you heard that he was going to be preaching there, and, and you, you, you wanted to go hear who this Jesus guy was, because you've been hearing some of these stories of some of the amazing things that he'd been doing. You, you've been hearing that, that, that he'd been preaching about the, the kingdom of God, and, and that when he spoke, he spoke with such authority, and he spoke in a way that, that really helped connect people to the to the real meaning of life and, and, and all of the, the healing and the hope and the wholeness that he brought. You had to check out who was this guy. And then you hear him say these words. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. 
Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. And we would probably be saying, no way, I'm not doing that. <clears throat> now, now imagine that you're one of Jesus' disciples. And you've been with Jesus for the last three years. And every day you've been hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom of God. And, and you know, God's intentions for all of us. And, and the wonder that, that, uh, of how God made us. And, and you're hearing all of this coming from from, from Jesus, and again, you've been traveling with him around the countryside, and you've seen some amazing things. He's bringing healing. He's bringing hope. He's bringing wholeness to all kinds of people, and you've been a witness to all of it. You've seen it all, and you're beginning to think Jesus embodies what he's talking about. He embodies the kingdom of God. And you're beginning to understand what it might mean that the, the kingdom of God is in our midst. What it might mean that the, the kingdom of God is within our grasp, that it's within <coughs> us, that, that, that another world is possible than, than the world that we see in, in front of us. And, 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 and you're beginning to have a sense that, you know, that, that what Jesus has, I can have too. And you're just filled with excitement. This can be mine. All that he has. And then you hear Jesus tell you, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and on the third day raised again. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I would react like Peter reacted. No way, Jesus. No way. And yet, after he did it, after he died, after he rose again, just before he ascends into heaven, he tells all of his followers actually promises you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea in Samaria and to the ends of the earth <coughs> you'll be his witness a witness to what? To be a witness to his power. The power that he manifested because of his connection with God. You know, and then you'll remember what he told you in his farewell speech in, in John 14, where, where Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. In fact, we'll do greater than these, says Jesus. And I can just hear the people say now, no way, no way. There's no way I can have access to the same power that Jesus has. There is no way that I will be able to do the works that he has done, or, he, or, or the, it's ridiculous to think even greater works than he. But there it is in Scripture. There it is in Jesus' mouth. <coughs> Jesus said it himself. <coughs> You will receive power and be able to do greater works than he. We say no way, but Jesus says yes way. Jesus says yes. 
why would Jesus send his disciples out in Matthew 10, saying to them, go and proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Why would Jesus be telling his followers, his disciples, and in essence telling us, us the same thing? Why would he be telling us to do this if it were not possible? What are we missing? What are we missing? Where's the power? I believe it all comes down to our unity with Christ. It all comes down to our unity with Christ and with each other. You know, not that we will ever reach perfection, but do we believe that all things are possible through Christ? Are we striving for that unity in Christ and that unity with one another? Two weeks ago, we learned from uh, the scripture I read in John 17 that in Jesus' farewell speech, that Jesus was praying for our unity, not just the unity of his 12 disciples, but all those who would believe because of their work of spreading the gospel. He prayed for our unity in Christ and our unity with each other. Because when we are united with Christ, we are united with God. Jesus said from John 17, let me remind you, <coughs> Jesus is praying, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So he's praying that we might be with God the Father and God the Son, Jesus. Might we be in them so that the world may believe that you have sent me? The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Is the number one priority in our life unity with Christ and unity with each other? Those of us who claim to follow Christ, is that our number one priority? Because Jesus makes it clear in his prayer that the way the world will become to believe, believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, is when they see it lived out in us. When they see it lived out in us. Do we live in such a way that people see Jesus in us? Do you live in such a way that people see Jesus in you? Not just when you're coming to church and looking good, but when you're outside of these doors. When you're back home or out on the streets or in your apartment or at the store or talking with your friends. Do they see Jesus Christ in you? Is the unity in our church so strong that it's obvious to outsiders that we have a common purpose, a common vision, a common goal, a common mission? You know, do they see God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness? Do they see that in us? And do they see that that is what is propelling us forward? God's love for everyone, no exceptions. Over the last two weeks, I've been asking uh, within uh, my sermon, what's the mission of rising hope? 
well, this week I've written both the mission statement and the vision statement in the bulletin. It's there. Our mission is to bring the power of Christ and the support of the church to the least, the lost, the lonely, and the left out in our community. If we want that power of Christ in our lives, we've got to be connected to that power. We have to be united with that power. These video monitors, they work because they're connected to a power source. They work because they're connected to electricity. Well, our electricity is different than that electricity. Our power source is God himself through the Holy Spirit. Are we connected with God through the Holy Spirit? Through the power that God has offered us, that Jesus said we will receive. Jesus couldn't be more clear. The power to be his witness to the ends of the earth, the power that comes through the gift of the Holy Spirit comes through our unity with Christ. We're called to be a witness to Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. But how can we be that witness unless we're demonstrating that power? You know, you can talk about Jesus and the resurrection and all the miracles that he did. You can talk about that until you are blue in the face. And most people are going to say, well, that's nice. That's nice. You know, that, 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 you know, those are words of hope <coughs> to help me when I'm going through a difficult time. You know, and that's a good story, and, and it happened back in Jesus' day, but no way it can happen today. Most people will not believe in something that is so amazing so astounding, so powerful as the, and wonderful as the power of the Holy Spirit. They won't believe in that that has the power to transform their life and transform the world. They won't believe that there's power to manifest the kingdom of God, what God wants here and now on earth as it is in heaven unless you show them. I think most people are from Missouri. You know? <laughs> unless you show me, I'm not going to believe. So I have to ask you a question. Where does the world see the power of Christ in your life? Where does the world see that power of the Holy <coughs> Spirit in your life? Where do they see it in us as a church? Where do they see it at Rising Hope? For the next 10 weeks, I'm going to be preaching from the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. It's called the, uh, the Book of Acts because uh, uh, it, it really highlights the actions of the Holy Spirit that brought that first church about. It really should be called uh, the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, not the Acts of the Apostles. Because it was the Holy Spirit that empowered great things to happen. And... The early church, they demonstrated, they demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, the power to witness, that same power that Christ had to witness to that. We read that the first church was 
united in prayer and, and worship. They, they met regular in the temple and, and regularly in each other's homes. They, they broke bread among, with themselves. They, you know, they, they were committed to the apostles' teachings. What that meant is they wanted to sit down and hear from those who were taught by Jesus himself just what this kingdom of God was about. That's what the apostles continued to teach. They had heard it from Jesus' mouth, what the kingdom of God is about, and they wanted to learn. Because somehow they knew that if they were connected in unity with all that Christ is and was and will ever be, they will live in that power too. There was such a bond between the people in the early church that, that there wasn't anybody in need. They took care of one another's needs. You know, yeah, did they have problems? <coughs> yeah, they had problems. They had to work things out sometimes. There were some times when uh, the, uh, the scripture talks about the, the, the Greek widows were not receiving their fair share of the food that the Hebrew widows were getting. And, 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 but they appointed deacons to help work it out. They didn't suddenly become perfect. But they were focused on being united in Christ and united with one another. And yes, the records show that the apostles did works as great as Jesus Christ. That early church, they received the power that Jesus Christ promised them. And if they can receive that power, we can receive that power as well. The early disciples went out preaching the kingdom of God, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. The men and women who were involved in that, they're no different than you and me. They were connected. Connected to Christ. Connected to each other. I can hear some of you saying, no, no way. I can just hear you in your minds. You're saying, no way. Did these early disciples have trouble believing? Yeah, they had trouble believing. <laughs> when Jesus was arrested, uh, actually before Jesus was arrested, Peter says, Lord, I'm never going to deny you. And then when he was arrested, what does he do? He denies him three times. He's afraid to admit that he even knew him. And then when Jesus is crucified, you know, all of the disciples ran with their tails high in the air. They wanted to get out of there. They didn't want to be seen. The only one that stayed was John and three women, Mary and two others. Those are the only ones that stayed to witness the crucifixion because they were scared to death. And Thomas? Thomas openly doubted what Jesus said about the resurrection. But when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they became witnesses to the ends of the earth, witnesses to the power of Jesus Christ, the power to transform lives, the power to manifest the presence of the kingdom of God. And they were effective witnesses to Christ because that same power that was on Christ was now on them. And that same power can be in us. All summer long, we're going to be preaching about what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts. And I want us to be praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon. Come, Holy Spirit. 
I don't know how that power will manifest itself, but I know that if we are serious in uniting with Christ and uniting with one another, that power will find a way upon us. Normally, the church has the, the red paraments only on Pentecost and on special occasions like ordinations and that sort of thing because the, the, the red paraments represent the fire of the Holy Spirit. And so you don't see us putting the red up that much. I'm going to leave it up all summer long. I'm going to leave it up all summer long to be reminded, so we are reminded, to pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. For the Holy Spirit to descend upon us. Open our hearts and minds. Give us the power that, that you have. The Holy Spirit's going to answer for us how we are going to bring the power of Christ and the support of the church to the least, the lost, the lonely, and the left out. The Holy Spirit will answer for us how we are going to be such a witness to the love of God in Christ in this community here at Rising Hope that it will be undeniable to anybody that the kingdom of God is at hand. The Holy Spirit is going to give us the answer how we will do that. How rising hope in 2016 is going to bring the power of Christ to our community. Come this September, united in prayer, united in Christ, united with each other, God will send Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will rebuild what God started here at Rising Hope. We will have the Spirit come upon us, and new life will be upon us. It will be much like when God worked with Nehemiah to rebuild the city walls. God will work with us <coughs> to rebuild our foundation. And we will be singing, I know I've been changed.